My name is Ashlyn. I'm a project manager working mostly with Samanu. So who are we at Beyond Essential Systems? I'll just give you a bit of an overview first. Um, we're a B corporation with 50 staff in offices in Melbourne, Auckland and Fiji. We've got project staff throughout partner countries. We develop and implement free open source software for health and education on behalf of our project partners. And we believe in profitable sustainability or this idea of profit for purpose. So we really try to be financially sustainable and put as many profits as we can back into our projects. Just a, a note that these are live demonstrations, so things do go wrong. Uh, please be patient. And of course, it's impossible to show everything that we do, all of our features and all of our projects. So engage with us, ask questions. We want to hear from you, the users. And also a note that you can implement our entire ecosystem at a national level with millions of patients, but you can also implement just one product for a really small project with just a few dozen uh, beneficiaries. So we love having any impact at all. That's what we're really about, Beyond Essential Systems. So today, a bit of an overview of BES, as I've just gone through, but also I'll demonstrate a couple of aspects of our software suite. And then I'll hand over to a few of our staff members, and they're going to talk through uh, our Tamanu HL7 Fire compliant API. If that's all mumbo jumbo to you, um, they'll go through that in detail and it will be clear as mud by the end, I promise. We're also going to go through uh, the Pi integration capabilities as well. So you can see how our different software um, implements, uh, integrate, sorry, with Tupaya. And then finally, a couple of user design improvements and changes that we've made to Tamanu and Felicity will go through that with us all. So a bit of an overview of our software. Maybe, Kurt, um, we can jump into the API and, and start while well, Ashton sorts out um, any of your internet issues for today. So I am the, uh, just full screen this. So I'm the solutions architect at uh, Beyond the Central Systems. And behind the scenes, we have been working really, really hard um, to uh, create a data exchange and to open up um, data exchange in an API form um, using HL7 uh, standards. Um, and uh, if you don't know what that is, I'll just go through it right now. So HL7 Fire, the HL7 stands for um, uh, Health Level 7. And um, yeah, it's, it's a set of standards. So it's basically to stop uh, back a really long time ago, um, any system had to integrate with another system, they would just create a, a bespoke way of doing it. Um, so all these different, um, th there, there was no standards, all these different ways of exchanging data emerged and it became um, a little bit of a, uh, everyone was speaking in different ways basically. So the fire side of things, um, which is fast healthcare interoperability resources, I always have to read that, I never remember it. Um, and that's a standard of health data exchange that was published by HL7. Um, it's really important and in the next slide we'll go through to distinguish between uh, HL7 and HL7 fire. They refer to very, very, very different approaches. Um, and like I said before, it's just to establish a set of standards um, by uh, and, and exactly how those standards uh, have been established and the way that they approach different concepts. Um, I'll go through it in a little bit, uh, but the basic idea is that there are resources. So the idea of a, a diagnostic report or a patient um, is a resource and that that data has certain um, certain attributes associated with it, and then that can be exchanged. So that's sort of the, the underlying approach. And the way that that's exchanged, um, that's with an API, so an application programming interface. We've created um, a bunch for Tamanu to integrate with uh, external systems, um, but the underlying approach of an API um, is, is what really underpins HL7 file. Um, right, so HL7 versus HL7 Fire. Um, HL7 is, 
is a lot older. So there's two versions of that. Um, and HL7, um, it really exchanged data. At, uh, it was created, sorry, it was created in the, the 90s, uh, HL7 version two, and it really reflects that. Um, the, in its approach to how data is exchanged. So obviously the uh, internet has evolved um, in massive leaps and bounds since then. And um, what they really needed was an update to how that how data is looked at and how it's exchanged. And that's where HL7 Fire comes in. Um, and so it really leverages a whole bunch of these evolutionary leaps that happen on the internet. Um, and it looks at data the same way that software developers look at data, um, which is as uh, resources and using HTTP um, as the means, uh, the request and response as a means to uh, exchange data. And that will, if that doesn't make any sense, it's all gonna be hopefully become abundantly clear when we go through the, uh, the demo after this. Um, and like I said before, there's these resources. Uh, so patient is a resource, uh, medication is a resource, imaging request is a resource. Um, and the idea is to really establish those sets of standards and, and the data that is associated with each of those resources. So that when we, when Tamano comes to integrate with, let's say a la laboratory um, system, mm. there's a set of standards that we can both uh, look at and, and be confident that, um, if we have to have that concept of a patient in another system that we integrate with, that will have already been established and we can work towards that standard. Uh, why adopt it? I think, uh, yeah, there's a whole range of reasons um, and reduces learning curve. So that means that we're not creating a bespoke solution for every single integration that we have. Um, improves ease of real-time interoperability um, and yeah, so we're, we're all speaking the same language. Uh, faster, simpler applic application creation. And that comes from we can, that reusability that we have. So once we've established what a patient is from one system, we can reuse it again with another and that just makes things much faster. So this is our roadmap as it stands for Tamanu. At the moment, we have these, this concept of a, of, a, of a patient and you can see there's a pretty heavy bias here towards us um, supporting COVID data exchange, which, which was the uh, kind of the imperatives of the moment over the last couple of years. And we, we, we've got patient details. So if you're building a, a HL7 Fire API, probably the first thing you'll look at is a patient and exchanging patient details. Uh, we've also got COVID-19 test data and vaccination data. And these are these APIs that we have at the moment. Uh, looking forward, we've got uh, an imaging, uh, we're looking at uh, integrating with an imaging software. So exchanging imaging requests and then receiving those results. So that's an important point that it's not just us making data available to uh, external systems to, to consume that data, but we can also receive um, results back for something like that. So we can have our internal state updated through the API by a, um, by a request that's sent from uh, an external system. Uh, so too with these uh, medi medication prescriptions, which we're, we're integrating with uh, and the subscription model. Now the subscription model here in this case is, um, is, is not a piece of data that we're, um, that, that we're supporting in the future, but more of an approach. Um, and that is uh, so that when we integrate with uh, a, an external system, we can implement a workflow by which, say a patient will update their details, an external system can subscribe to, to Manu and receive a notification when that patient has updated their details or when a new patient has been created. And that's really important for uh, these sorts of integrations because it allows for an external system to be aware of a change in state within Tamanu. Um, so looking even further afield, we've got uh, these, uh, we're gonna integrate with an external limb software um, and that will require lab requests. Uh, to, to once there's a lab request created in Tamanu, that will get sent through to the LIMS software, and then they can send us the results. 
and there would almost certainly be a subscription model involved in that in that workflow there and so too with dispensed medications which is happening with our integration with m supply so that's our roadmap um what we're going to do now is i will hand this over to megs and megs and i will work through a um yeah some uh, a demonstration of um how things are looking behind the scenes and how that relates to the front end awesome thank you kurt uh can you see my screen i should be sharing the tamanu desktop uh, login page I think that's a thumbs up. Awesome. Okay. So the Tamanu components of this demonstration are really not the key aspect of the demonstration. So I'll move through it uh, pretty quickly um, and then be handing back to Kurt at, at a couple of stages for him to demonstrate our API working in real time. So if you do have any specific questions uh, about the functionality that you do see within Tamanu, feel free to reach out with any questions um, or reach out to your PMs, uh, uh, project managers. All right, so I'm going to log in and first of all, we're going to create a new patient today for our demonstrations. Uh, so our patient is going to be Ned Flanders. Pop in his date of birth. Now there's a, a range of other details that we can register, uh, register with our patients, but I'm just going to do our key, key set for today's demonstration. So we're going to create Ned's record. All right, so we can now see that Ned's uh, record has been created. So I just quickly want to point out uh, that he's also been assigned a unique ID, so his national health number. So that's the, the four letter, six numbers, alphanumeric uh, unique ID that's been associated with his medical record. So first of all, I'm going to record a COVID lab test for Ned. So quickly, I just need to create an encounter to record this lab request under. So I'll enter the details for this encounter first. And we'll say he's getting a COVID test today. And then we'll confirm that details. Okay, so we can now see that encounter has been created for Ned. So I'm going to jump into the record of that encounter and create a lab request. All right, so he's having a COVID-19 swab today and a nasopharyngeal swab. So we'll finalize that request. Now, obviously there would be a period of time between these two actions, uh, but I'll go in and I'll record the results of his COVID-19 test. So he's tested negative for today. Um, again, a range of other fields that we can enter here, uh, but not the key, key purpose of today's demonstration. So I'll confirm that result. And then I'll just also update the status of that lab request to published and save those details. Okay, so now we've created a new patient, Ned, and we've recorded a lab test and entered results against that COVID lab test. So I'm going to hand back over to Kurt and he's going to demonstrate our API in real time. I hope everyone can see this screen here. Um, just as a, this is, this is piece of software called Postman, really quick uh, crash course in how API works, APIs work. Um, it works by there's a, a request, so it's the same as with the internet. You request a web, web page and you get a response, which is that web page. This is happening on sort of a lower level by which you uh, request to an API a piece of data and then you get that data uh, provided. You have permissions and everything like that. So essentially what's happening here in this screen is um, it's broken up between the request in the top half see there and then the response in the bottom so you got save response there um, so when we send the request we get a response back um, another thing to be aware of is um, that we talk here at BES about um, you know having data available to external systems and integrating with them um, a really strong pillar of that uh, is that we need to we take security uh, very, very seriously. All the data that you'll see here today is um, is just demo data, uh, but also at the first um, exchange that data exchange that we'll have with the UAT server is a login, um, and we will do a request. So we have a um, username and password, and I'll send it, and then we get a response. Now this response here includes a token. 
uh, and it's got a whole bunch of metadata down here. Um, but the idea of a token here is that it, um, we put that in the header of all subsequent requests, and that is used to um, authenticate the request to make sure that that particular user will have access to the data that they are requesting. Um, and we have other levels, layers of, of security here as well, um, including sort of just whitelisting the IP, which means making sure we know the source of the incoming request, um, and that they're just to be aware that there are multiple layers of security at work here. So we log in, we get a response, which is this token here. And what we can do is we can begin to um, get access to the data. So the first piece, we'll try and um, fetch the record for uh, Ned Flanders. So what I have to do is I have to just chuck the uh, token that we created in the header. And you'll see here that we've got the uh, identifier. Uh, and this says, fetch the patient, uh, gender male, we know that uh, Ned Flanders is male, uh, and um, I, we've got a two-part um, identifier. And the idea is this is the application reference number. So this is the Tamanu ID. We're using that namespace. The idea here is that we can have multiple, we'll support multiple different types of identifier. So if we had Ned Flanders um, post, uh, sort of a passport ID, we could have that, we could have his driver's license, all these different um, uh, IDs that we support. So I will just type in the one that Meg's created before for Ned Flanders. And hopefully we can see some of that information come through. And there we, yeah, there we got it. So we'll see Ned Flanders, we'll see he was born on the uh, 9th of the 10th, 65 and we see that data coming through now what we also want to see is we also want to see that test um so i'll just copy and paste uh this in here and we've got this other so you see the resource here which is a patient the next resource we have is a diagnostic report um and so this is leveraging this idea of developing standards and resources that you have with HL7 Fire. There's no such thing as a COVID test resource, for example. So what you have to do is you have to figure out a diagnostic report um, represents a COVID test, but it also can represent other things. So the results of an X-ray, for example, um, is, a, is a diagnostic report. So that really shows you these quite high level uh, resources that exist in HL7 Fire and the way that you become compliant, which is you take your data model and you map it onto the one that exists um, in HL7 and one that will be understandable to external integrations as well. So checking that ID in here. Now you will notice that I haven't um, put in the token and that's because I'm using a, a, an old token. Those tokens last for one hour. So I just checked this out to make sure that everything worked beforehand uh, and I'm using an old token there. And what do we have? We have Ned Flanders. Uh, we have that he had a naso, nasopharyngeal swab. I, I swear that I could pronounce that uh, when we tried it out beforehand. Uh, there's a practitioner. So the doctor, um, if, if, if uh, we had the name related to that doctor, that would be coming through here. And then we've got the results. So the results is an observation resource and we can go to that observation resource and get that result. Um, we can also uh, include it and expand it here. So we can see here that uh, we're getting the details for Ned Flanders and we can see um, that he got a COVID test. So I'll hand it back over to Mix and uh, we can go through a vaccination. Awesome, thank you, Kurt. Okay, so now we're going to show you the vaccination data pulling through the API. So you should be able to see Ned Flanders patient record here on my screen. So I'm going to record a COVID-19 vaccine for, for Ned. So I go to our immunization tab, select give vaccine. We select campaign for our COVID-19 vaccinations. He's going to receive an AstraZeneca vaccine today. 
enter in the batch number. He's receiving dose one today. I'll enter the location, the department, and then it's been administered by myself today. All right, and we'll confirm those details. And now that vaccination record has been saved to Ned's medical record. So that's, that's all for my part now. I'm gonna hand it back over to Kurt and he's going to demonstrate the vaccination data pulling through our HR7 fire integration. Oakley dokely do. Um, so we have, uh, yeah, so hopefully we can access uh, the, the, the vaccination that makes us just created. Uh, again, just to labor the point, you can see here that this is an immunization resource. Um, it's not something like COVID vaccination or vaccination. Um, and that is what has been going on in, um, that's, that's what's been going on in HL7 Fire. So that's what they've decided is a meaningful resource that has the broader, that is a concept that exists, uh, that's the most useful in uh, data interchange between systems. So what I will do is I will just uh, search for that. Uh, excellent. So you can see that the, uh, this is what happens once the token expires. So I'll just, Use the one that I prepared earlier. Chuck that in the header. And hopefully, yeah. So what we've got is the immunization. And I'll just make that a little bit bigger. And we can see that Ned Flanders up here, um, Covast. Uh, so that is, uh, AstraZeneca. Um, and yeah, you can see here that there's a whole bunch of uh, codes uh, and coding standards that you can employ here. Um, so this is one that we have used from um, uh, the health terminologies for the Australian government. Uh, but you'll also notice that these square brackets represent that this is um, an array so we can support multiple different standards at once and that's really really important um that you can't just uh you know you employ hl7 fire and hope everything's going to be fine if you're using your own crazy set of standards and no one else is using them the idea here is that uh HL7 file will determine what the structure of the data that you receive is, but then the actual descri description of the data and the standards that are applied, um, you can use um, a whole series of different uh, standards there. So there's internal ones to HL7, um, and then there's also uh, things like, like SNOMED and ICD-10 and 11. Um, but I, I get carried away, but you can see that, uh, yeah, immunization, uh, Ned Flanders uh, has had his first dose and he has been, uh, he's on the way to being completely vaccinated. So thank you all so much. And um, I will hand it back over to Ashlyn. Um, and any questions, um, I'm sure my email will come through after and I'm happy to answer anything and uh, on that, but thank you all so much. Thanks, Kurt and Megan, and apologies, everyone. Um, isn't it wonderful Tamanu can work offline? It's not for the remote settings. It's for metropolitan cities in Australia. <laughs> uh, that was wonderful. Were there any questions for either Kurt or Megan? If they do come to you, just pop them in the chat and we can answer them a bit later on. I might hand over now to Erin, who's going to show us some of the integrations that can be done with Tupaya. Thanks, everybody. I will share my screen. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Chapara integrations because it probably follows on nicely from um, speaking about the Tomato integrations. It's far less technical, so hang on to your hats. Um, but our first integration is just to show you how diverse our team really is. This is what our Wahiki Island team is up to today. They've left the office and they are saving stranded dolphins. So there's that profitable sustainability model in action. See, we look to help everyone. 
Um, the first integration I would like to mention is obviously Tamanu data going straight into Japaya. So what I think is important here is that if you've got a patient level EMR, what you're going to want is um, some aggregate data. And we keep Japaya really um, PHI free. So there's no patient level information. So it's not as... Um, you know, it's not as sensitive as the data in Tamanu. So a country might be really keen to have that aggregate data available for reporting for multiple departments, but they might not want patient details readily available. So I feel like countries are more likely to keep their uh, Tamanu logins pretty restricted and who's got access to that sort of system. Um, yet we, you know, we would say there's no, there's so much permission granularity in Tupaya that there's there's no need for that. So you can you can have different dashboards with different um, information across the show, and just give the people that need it that sort of access. But they wouldn't ever see a patient's name or address or anything like that. So um, what we're showing here is information about COVID vaccines in Samoa. So we're disaggregating by gender and age, dose, island, um, and then the next one is showing this sort of information mapped. So Tamanu doesn't really show any visuals like this. So we would say that, you know, instead of having somebody enter the data twice, the ideal scenario is that you would enter patient level data into Tamanu uh, and you would see the aggregate data in Tupaya. And then we would work with the project to decide what is the best way to show that information. Is it, does it have any impact mapped? So in this situation, some will use the map to, you know, inform the next day of the vaccine program based on where there was high and low vaccine coverage. And, you know, we, we also showed this data, as you can see over here at the village level. So vaccination rates um, that were quite low at the village level that informed the next day's um, outing. So the next thing that we can do, which is a relatively new feature in Japan, is show two pieces of data at the same time. Um, and in this case, what we're seeing is active cases of COVID-19 by village overlaid with the places, you know, the, the vaccination um, rates where people have had a booster by district. So what you can see here is that they, you know, the lighter orange means there's been more, more booster doses given out here and that's where the cases are. So you're looking at a pretty, um, a pretty strong correlation between quite vaccinated people and COVID cases. So hopefully they're not getting too sick. Um, and this is all information that's feeding straight into Japaya visuals from the Tamanu data collection. So we're not asking anyone to re-enter data again based on what's happening at the district or the village. This individual data is feeding through and auto-aggregating into Pyre. The next integration is with M Supply. So I'm sure that probably most of you are familiar with, uh, with M Supply, but it's a um, logistics management information system used for drug and medical commodities uh, in most or many Pacific Island countries. And this example is us showing the information in the project that's called UNFPA, and they've got a reproductive health platform across six countries in the Pacific and four of those countries, well, sorry, it's eight countries in the Pacific and six of those countries now um, with the addition of Fiji and Samoa use M Supply. So we'll be adding them to these visuals soon. And what we're doing here is pulling in just the information that the reproductive health team needs on stock status of those items that are relevant to them. So prior to this sort of information, reproductive health would have had to go and check with pharmacy what's going on in each of these um, countries. And it, this information is pulled from the national medical stores of each of these countries. So reproductive health shouldn't be taking up pharmacy's time by asking what the stock status is. Pharmacy doesn't have time to give that information to reproductive health. They should be able to see it themselves. Now, we don't want someone in reproductive health to have to use, to learn to use DHIS2 and M Supply and have all of those instances deployed on their computer. They should just be able to see a snapshot of the information they need from all of these different systems in a single platform. And that's the whole aim of Tupaya. It's not supposed to replace M Supply or DHIS2, it's supposed to pull in information to a wider audience instead of everybody having to go and hunt around at the various departments that do have those instances of the different um, software on their computer. So here we can see that, and it, it, you can also drill down to the country level on these visuals. And so, you know, in Kiribati, they can see, the reproductive health team can see the availability of contraceptives at all M Supply using facilities in their um, country. And that data comes in monthly at the end of each month. And this is just a basic snapshot of whether it's out of stock or overstock or appropriately. So basically 
rate is your action. Anything above that is probably pretty good. This is a further example of how we're showing it at the facility level. So we're pulling in just from the national medical stores here and you can see over time what's going on um, for months of stock and AMC. So that's giving everybody, you know, in the reproductive health team an idea of a sort of further drill down at the national level what is being distributed out to the facilities. Now, it depends how well each individual facility is using M Supply as to whether the facility information will be good after this um, national warehouse, but we know that in a lot of these countries, the national warehouse is at least using it really well. So this information should be quite useful. The next integration is something called open weather, which I don't think it particularly matters which weather website you like the best, but for this project in Laos, we used open weather because um, our information from people on the ground in country was that this website had robust weather for Laos. So this project is looking at, it's an emergency operations center um, desktop setup. And what we're looking at is temperature information overlaid at the same time as um, dengue, measles, and malaria information. So what's of note here is that we're pulling in forecast rainfall and observed rainfall. So forecast temperature and observed temperature. So you would be able to look at sort of a predictor for an issue that might come with flood. And then you might be able to look at the DHIS2 information after that, um, showing where the dengue cases came. So does there an increase in, you know, in, Rainfall lead to an increase in disease, um, and here's an example of that. So at the same time, we're showing dengue cases by province and forecast rainfall. So what you could do here, and I haven't done it for the purpose of the example, but what they would probably figure out in country is an, an, a time period after which excessive rainfall might lead to a spike in dengue cases. So obviously increased amounts of water, it leads to increased birth of mosquitoes, leads to increase vector carriers, uh, vectors to carry the disease. So they would toggle the dates here to look for, okay, when do we know that um, a higher rainfall is gonna lead to a higher dengue case? And that's sort of the way of the two pieces of information coming in. So this health information is pulling straight from DHIS2. In LAO, we're not asking somebody to re-enter that data. We, we are integrating again with the DHIS2 platform and we're pulling in from open weather to get the weather information. So it's two pieces of information coming into a totally different platform to hopefully a different set of users. So we don't ask all these people to have DHIS2 on their computer and know how to use it or ask them to flick back to a website that's got the weather data. We're putting it all in one place. And I guess what you do with that information in your country or project, the possibilities are endless and it's up to you. Um, this next one we're showing is Tupaya Meditrack integrating with Tupaya, which I mean, you'd hope so. We made them both, so it'd be weird if they didn't. But this is the way of getting basic survey data into Tupaya. Now, the interesting thing with this project, which is Fana Fana Ola in Tonga, is it also integrates with DHIS2. So we're asking somebody at a facility level each month to pop in the amount of rotavirus vaccines that were delivered. This is being entered at a facility called PIA. You then see that information put on a graph within the Tupaya platform. Um, and again, the permission level that you give to this project and who can see this is totally up to each country. So we could have it that PIA staff can see this visual, but they can't see the national level one or the other way around, or you know, that they can see this information, but they can't see the rest of the information in a project. It's all really malleable. And it's, you know, it's, it's allowing for the data that exists to go into a place where it can be shared, where it needs to be shared, but it doesn't necessarily need to be shared with anybody who has a URL. Um, you still have a great deal of control over who can see it. And then this information will aggregate. So each facility is doing this same survey, sending in their rotavirus vaccine numbers by month. And then this, this data aggregates up to national level. Importantly, this information is also going into the DHIS2 platform. So HIS department are getting their full set of data as well without any data re-entry. But each, um, you know, every department, say the reproductive health, uh, no, who would do vaccines? The EPI team can see this information into PIA without needing to go to DHIS2 and ask for that information. So it's sort of putting the information in one place with a single data entry with a lot of different um, options as far as who can see the information. And that's all. I will pass back to Ashlyn. And again, any questions in the chat or please email. 
Thank you, Erin. Very exciting to see how all of the system integrates and can be used to complement one another. So again, any questions, please ask or pop them in the chat. And I'm now going to hand over to Felicity and she's going to demonstrate some of the design changes and improvements that we've made to Tamanu. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I am just going to go through some of um, the UX and UI improvements that we've made recently. Uh, the first one is the addition of some navigation tools that will help you move through the platform a little bit easier. Um, the first one is the addition of breadcrumbs. So I'll show you what that is. Search for a patient here. Um, so we're in a patient um, encounter here, for example, and you'll see at the top these little blue um, links. So these are called breadcrumbs and basically they help you go back to uh, various pages that you were on. So for example, we can click on Roy here and we can go back to his um, patient landing page um, and we can also go back to our inpatients there as well. Um, in addition to that, we have also um, created, so say we're in another encounter, um, we've also created this block here with the name and the initials to be clickable as well. So that will also, when clicking, will take you back to that patient landing page. So two um, navigation little tools for you so you don't have to go back all the way back and then um, back into the patient where you were before. Um, the next thing is we have, um, sorry, I'll just go into an encounter. So um, what we've done here as well is we've moved the location of some of our main action buttons. Um, so here you'll see um, those main action buttons, for example, here, record vitals, um, new procedure, um, labs, and also um, in the patient landing page, um, here as well. So new survey, uh, new referral. So we've moved these buttons to above the table. So previously they were located at the bottom of the table here. So you actually have to scroll all the way down to the bottom um, to, to see that action. Uh, so that's a little improvement as well, just to, um, to make your life a bit easier and less scrolling. Uh, the next thing as well is we have um, segmented the two sections of the page so that you can um, better see um, the patient information while scrolling and looking on this part of the screen. So you'll notice now there's a scroll bar for the patient um, details uh, section and then a scroll bar for the um, actual content on this side. So most of the time, if we don't have a bunch of um, data in here, this would just be static. Whereas previously, if you were scrolling, you would actually lose um, sight of a lot of this information. Uh, the next thing is that we have um, fixed a lot of the headers to the top of the page. So again, just a navigation improvement for you. So as you're scrolling, you can see that this is now static at the top of the page um, so that you can maybe be down the bottom of the page and still navigate through where you need to go. Um, various headers look a little bit different on each page, but you'll find that um, the, the main headers are static at the top there. So on this one, we've got this header with our um, main action button there, static. Uh, we've also made an improvement in the buttons. So um, there should be a little bit more consistency for you um, with the buttons throughout the platform. Um, just those sort of, you know, visually um, important buttons that are easy for you to see versus the secondary buttons that are maybe not as used as often. Um, so that's a very minor change um, there. Uh, we've also removed some of the inactive pages that were showing under the administration um, navigation. So we had a few pages there that um, aren't yet active. So we have just mo removed them for the time being um, to clean that up a little bit. Uh, we also just going back into uh, patient. Roy. Roy is my favorite patient. <laughs> um, so what we've done also is as we grow, we've been um, finding the need to add more 
um, data and information points in um, the patient admission block at the top here. Uh, so we've redesigned this to be a little bit clearer um, and just to create a little bit more space on the page too. So previously, um, you'll probably remember they were all of the data points were in boxes that was taking up a little bit of room and was becoming a little bit hard to read. So we've just made an improvement there. Uh, so you'll be able to um, see that information a little bit easier. Um, we have also oh, in imaging requests, so going into a new imaging request, we have added the time here. Um, so you now pop in the date and time um, for a new imaging request. So that's now a new mandatory field. Um, and we have um, made another change. Uh, so we've pop this button, this view button back onto this encounter. So I'm not sure if you remember, it was there a while ago and then it was um, removed and this whole block was clickable. Um, we've since learned that it's probably a little bit clearer to just have that view button there. Um, and that's the only clickable thing on this page in order to view that patient encounter. So this um, larger piece of real estate is no longer clickable. And to view that encounter, you just click on view there and you um, can see the encounter. Um, okay, in patient death, um, just want to make sure I've got everything. Yep. Um, so when recording a patient, oh, I don't think actually I was going to go. Oh, yeah. So when recording a patient death, um, you'll notice that we have just updated um, this. I'm not sure if you've used this much, but you'll see now um, all of the mandatory fields that are required when recording a patient death are marked with a little red asterisk. Uh, so that's clear around what needs to be filled out there. Um, and the lucky last is that um, we have made the pregnancy question when recording a death um, conditional to whether the patient was female. So um, for example, this patient here is male, so um, will not be asked if the patient um, was pregnant when uh, they died. Whereas if we have a female patient, um, that question will be asked. So I'll just very quickly um, grab a female patient so we can see what that looks like. We've got a lot of male patients. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh goodness, so many male patients. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so if we go into record death and then continue, uh, continue, you'll see here was the woman pregnant? Um, and if we click yes, we'll be given another question Did the pregnancy contribute to death? Which is not there if the patient is male. Uh, and that is all of the UI improvements for the current round. Wonderful. Thanks, Felicity. That's great. And that brings us to the end of our session today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And we look forward to seeing you at the next community demo next month. Thanks, all. <laughs>